In this video, we'll start our study of pragmatics. Pragmatics is the study of language in context. So sure enough, you can have a sentence like call me a cab, and it literally means two things. It can mean get me a means of transportation or assign unto me the label cab. Both readings are in theory possible. However, from the context, you'll know that only one of these is acceptable under these circumstances. This is what pragmatics is, the study of how context helps us determine the meanings of sentences. And um, sure enough, we've studied context before. For example, we studied deictics, which are words that get their specific meaning from context. We have the sentence, she is there now. And in order for you to understand what the sentence means, you need to know who she is, uh, where there is, and when now is. So you need to get this information from some context, but this is only single words interacting with the concept. In pragmatics, we're going to think bigger, and we're going to think of entire sentences and how we get to their interpretation. For example, in the sentence, can I order pizza? If you just look at the structure, it really could mean two things. Shall I order pizza? And do I have the capacity to order pizza? However, from context, we know that the shall I order reading is the only one that is acceptable in most circumstances. And that's what makes the other reading, the do I have the capacity reading, so strange, which is what makes the conver this conversation weird. Can I order pizza? I don't know. Can you order pizza? So how are humans going to decipher their context? The most important idea here is that humans are going to try to help each other figure this out. This is called the cooperative principle. It says that when humans are speaking, they're going to try to be as helpful as possible. They're going to try to help you understand what they are saying. And in order to do this, they're going to follow four principles, which are called the Gricean maxims. The first one is the maxim of quality. It says that humans are going to try to be truthful, that they'll tell you the truth, and, or that they have some information to back up what they said. Second, hum, uh, humans are going to follow the maxim of quantity, which says that, that they'll say just the right amount of things to be understood. They won't say too little, or, and they won't say too much. The third maxim is the maxim of relation or relevance. It says that humans are going to try to say things that are relevant to the conversation, that they're not going to ramble off with some completely unrelated comment. And fourth is we have the maxim of manner, which means that humans are going to try to be as clear as the circumstances allow them. Uh, they're going to try to use words that you'll understand, and they're going to try to make their stories follow a logical line from beginning to middle to end, and so forth. So all these maxims are specific ways in which humans will try to help each other understand each other and their context. We call this the cooperative principle. Let's look at each of the maxims. We first have the maxim of quality. So when someone, uh, when you're listening to someone speak, you're going to assume that they're not lying to you. You're going to assume that they have evidence for what they're saying or that they're just saying, telling the truth as they know it. For example, if you're in Hanover in December and you ask someone, what's the weather like? They could say it's snowing and you're going to assume that they're either telling you the truth because they know or they have enough evidence to make this statement. If you're in Arizona in July in a different context and you had the exact same exchange, what's the weather like? It's snowing. It would be really strange because you know that the person is either lying or joking or doesn't really know what they're talking about. So this is the maxim of quality, expecting other people to tell you the truth or to tell you things for which they know what they're talking about. By the way, the pound sign means that the reading is not acceptable in context. You don't need to learn the technical term, but the technical term is that they're not felicitous. The second maxim is the maxim of quantity. It says that humans will not provide irrelevant details. They'll say what they need to say, no more, no less. For example, if you have a question, where did you grow up? 
the answer is going to depend on the context. If you're both on a, in some faraway land and far away from the US and you ask, where did you grow up? In the US is going to be a good answer because it has just the right amount of information. If you're both in California, for example, where did you grow up? In Ohio is going to be a, an also a good amount of information. It says uh, it has enough to place you on a map and it doesn't provide the listener with irrelevant details. If you're all in Ohio, you could say in Dayton and that'll be fine. And if you're all from Dayton, you could say on the corner of Maine and Minor. However, if you were all in Thailand and someone asked you, where did you grow up? On the corner of Maine and Minor. That would be that would not be helpful because it would give you irrelevant information that doesn't answer the question. That would violate the maxim of quantity. Also, I imagine if someone, if you asked, where did you grow up? And someone said, in the house next to the cemetery, but then on a house 10 blocks away with a street that looked like it led to an alley but didn't. This is way too many irrelevant details. And it's difficult to, to imagine a context where this could be a good answer for that question. Next, we have the maxim of relation or relevance, which is very important. You will assume that whatever the other person is saying will have some relevance to the conversation. For example, let's say you ask, is Jamie dating anyone these days? And the other person replied, well, she goes to Cleveland every weekend. So at, at first glance, it seems like these two sentences have nothing in common. So when that happens, you're going to try to figure out how to make them have something in common because you will assume the cooperative principle is operating. You will assume the other person is actually trying to help you understand and to give you an answer. So if you ask, is Jamie dating anyone these days? And someone says, well, she goes to Cleveland every weekend. You're going to try to compute this as, as she goes to Cleveland every weekend because she's dating to see the person she's dating or something like this. You're going to force it to be relevant because you will assume they are being cooperative. The second sentence doesn't make sense because there's no way to compute a way in which the answer B is relevant to the question A. What do you do for a living? My favorite color is purple too. Finally, we have the maxim of manner, which says that you will try to communicate as clearly and as possible. You will try to be orderly. You will tell stories in, in a linear, logical manner. You will try to be brief. You will try to use words that the other person can understand. If someone asks, what do you do for a living? And you say, I'm a linguistics instructor. That would be a good answer because it has relatively easy words. It's brief. It's a well-formed sentence. Whereas if you asked, what do you do for a living? And someone said, what I do is that I'm an L3 type lecturer of the subject matter that I teach is linguistics, which you might also call the science of the language, if you will. This doesn't make sense, first of all, because it's too much irrelevant information, but also what is an L3 type lecturer that does not answer the question, what do you do for a living? It is unnecessary jargon that is not even helping the other person understand. This violates the maxim of manner. If you violate a maxim, listeners will assume that the cooperative principle is still operating and that you are violating it on purpose. So if you're saying something irrelevant, they will try to force it to be relevant. For example, uh, a, for example, where's the roast beef? If you say, well, the dog looks happy, then the other person will assume that the dog looking happy has to do with the roast beef somehow. Probably the dog took the roast beef or something. Let's look at a violation of the maxim of manner. Let's say some kids are around and you don't want them to get all excited about ice cream. Uh, A1 asks, what do you want to get? And um, B1 says, well, we shouldn't get I-C-E-C-R-E-A-M. <laughs> this, uh, what B1 is saying is, of course, obfuscating the message is making it more confusing and longer but the person is trying to be as clear as possible under the circumstances and the circumstances is that they don't want the kids to list to hear the word ice cream so people are going to try to be as clear as possible under the circumstances and if not the other person will assume that they're still trying to be clear 
there are special types of violations of maxims um, when listeners, when people do it on purpose. And this is for things like sarcasm, irony, insults, and humor. For example, you can violate the maxim of quantity as in A1. If you say, Bill and Martha are leaving tomorrow, I'll miss Martha. You're giving less information than you should because you're not saying anything about Bill. However, the other person will assume that you are not saying enough on purpose and that the statement, I'll miss Martha, is actually a statement about how you won't miss Bill. So see, the what A1 has to do is assume that your answer violated the maximum of quantity for a reason, that you didn't say anything about Bill because you didn't want to, not simply because you forgot to say something about Bill. You can violate the maximum of relevance and the maximum of quality at the same time. I might win the lottery. Yeah, and pigs might fly. So this is giving you information that is untrue, so it violates the maximum of quality, and it's giving you information that it's irrelevant because the person is talking about lottery and that the other one answers with pigs. But of course, this is, yes, sarcasm. This one, for example, has a bunch of violations bunched upon one another. Did you notice how my voice filled the hole last night? Oh, yes, dear. In fact, I noticed several people leaving to make room for it. This is, first of all, a, mis a deliberate misinterpretation of one of the words, filled, and it violates the maximum of quantity because it gives you much more information than you need it, and it is a, a violation of the maximum of relevance which is why are you giving them information about the seats? And of course, what the, uh, what the soprano would assume is that she's being insulted by the contralto because all these violations would amount to a clear message that the contralto doesn't want to say to the soprano's face, which is, you sounded terrible or something like that. In summary, this is what pragmatics does. It studies language in context. People interpret context through the uh, cooperative principle. And they interpret the cooperative principle by looking at the Gricean maxims, uh, assuming people are going to be relevant, they're going to speak uh, clearly, and so forth. And if people violate these maxims, the hero will assume that they're violating them on purpose. And so they will assume that they mean something else, for example, a joke or to be sarcastic and so forth. <laughs>